Posso passar para ele, Luísa? Acredito que sim, professor. I'm gonna put you as a host, Michael. Pode deixar. Sim. Boa, valeu. I think Zoom before had an option of uh, make a co-host, right? So for some reason they they removed it. Now the, there is just one the possibility of having one host. Well, as long as you can see the slides. You yeah, we can see the slides. We, we can, I think that's we can um... do everything. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> All right, Michael. So we, we can get started then. Um, on behalf of the department, thank you very much for being here with us. I'm looking forward to see the theory of mind here being applied to game theory. Um, you have 75 minutes, like I said, and um, we we ask questions as you as the presentation goes along. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to get to know some of you, and uh, so I hope this will be uh, a, an entertaining, at least, uh, presentation and something very different, probably, than what you've seen before. So this is work with Garrett Reitinger, who is at the University of Nevada, Reno, here in the United States. He was a former graduate student uh, at UC Irvine, and he and I have collaborated on a variety of projects um, that have to do with theory of mind. So let me give you the, the, um, the background here. So uh, the big question is why are humans so cooperative? Okay, this is a, a question that anthropologists, sociologists, people from many fields uh, have been puzzled over. Um, economists during the last recent decades have increasingly uh, used a variety of of explanations that generally focus on some kind of richer set of motivations that humans might have, individuals. And we might refer to social preferences, for example. Maybe people are altruistic, or they care about equity or fairness, or they care about reciprocity, or they strive to conform to social norms. Okay, so this is a whole class of explanation to under, uh, explanations used to, to explain why humans are cooperative. But we were going to think about a different kind of mechanism, which is cognition. So much less attention has been given to the role of cognition. Usually, economics models assume that uh, the actors are have very high cognitive ability, and they all have it. So there's homogeneity and a high level of cognition. Okay. Now, in this project, we're going to ask, what is the role of one particular kind of suite of cognitive capabilities that we call theory of mind ability. What's the role of that in human cooperation? And we're going to combine, this is going to be, uh, it's going to combine some theory and experiments, largely experimental. I will say something about the theory, uh, but we're going to combine methods from economics and psychology. And we're going to present three main findings. Okay, the first thing is that the theory is actually going to be quite ambiguous. Okay. And so it's possible that having higher theory of mind ability can lead to more cooperation, but it's also possible that it can lead to less cooperation. Uh, and it's going to depend on contextual factors, as, uh, as I'll demonstrate. Um, we're also going to ask this question of whether uh, and, and explore whether the theory of mind ability is operating solely through cognition, that is, belief formation, um, or is there also something to do with um, Motivation. Is it possible that theory of mind ability, the cognitive suite of faculties that people have, is it also, are those correlated with certain uh, preference traits that people have? We're going to show in our experiment that the theory of mind ability is operating solely through beliefs. It doesn't appear to be correlated with people's fixed uh, preference traits. And we're also going to show that having higher theory of mind ability can, under the right circumstances, lead to pretty significant payoff advantages. Okay, so there is a uh, there is an advantage to to having it. Okay, so what what is this theory of mind? Okay, so theory of mind is a term that uh, it, it was introduced uh, several decades ago uh, by an, by a primatologist uh, who asked whether chimpanzees have theory of mind. Uh, and uh, since then, this term theory of mind has been theory of mind is the ability to correctly at uh, attribute, correctly predict what other people are thinking or feeling, okay? So in a sense, it's been called mind reading. 
So I can, by looking at you, by seeing how you act, by looking at your expressions, by seeing your body movement, I can infer uh, what your desires are, what your intentions are, what your emotions are, what your beliefs are. And all social uh, animals um, use some kind of theory of mind in order to navigate the social world. It's a key part of social life is trying to understand what people are trying to do and how they're trying to, uh, to accomplish their goals. Really, the way that the way that theory of mind, when theory of mind was first uh, described and defined, it was talked about it as if it was an either or cognitive skill. You had it or you didn't. Do chimpanzees have theory of mind or do they not have theory of mind? Well, that sort of a simple view has uh, really been put to rest. Now, uh, scientists today understand theory of mind to really be a set of cognitive faculties, a set of abilities. So there's going to be a spectrum of theory of mind ability within some kind of across species or within a population. And there's evidence that you can uh, experimental, experimentally manipulate people's ability and success at reading other people's emotional states. So there's some experimental work on that. And my co-author and I actually have a paper on that. We're not going to talk about that today, though. Now, notice that in game theory, um, we we do recognize that there are different settings where we might make different assumptions about theory of mind. Though usually we don't call it theory of mind. Uh, on the on the to the extreme, we have no concept like rationalizability, where I have a belief about your preferences and your beliefs, and I have a belief about what you believe, what I believe, and I have a belief about what you believe, I believe you believe, and so on. This is a very very high level of theory of mind ability. On the other extreme, we we would have models in evolutionary game theory where there's no theory of mind ability. An actor inherits some behavioral disposition. They, they act on that disposition without thinking about what the consequences are of that. And then they then they replicate and a new generation comes in that and, and so on. And there's no theory of mind. And in between, we have other concepts like say level K theory, where some actors, maybe some actors can form first order beliefs about what others are gonna do, but maybe they're not really good at second order beliefs. That, that is, they they don't form accurate, they don't accurately form beliefs about what other people's beliefs are, and so on. So there may be different levels of belief that different people have. So in game theory, we do have um uh the we do have ideas that get at the uh this uh this I um this concept of theory of mind in different ways, though we don't usually use the word uh theory of mind. Um, but we're gonna in this paper, we're gonna look at some some specific things now. What's the role of theory of mind in human cooperation? Now, in economic models of cooperation, maybe the standard model you might think of as a repeated game with a folk theorem, where uh, you can use trigger strategies to uh, to support and sustain cooperation. Well, theory of mind plays a role in that. Okay, so you want to have a belief. If you're in in a game, in a repeated game, you want to have a belief, an accurate belief about your the your your partner's preferences. You want to have a a belief about what they're trying to maximize. You want to uh, have an idea about what kind of strategy you can use to uh, encourage them, incentivize them to cooperate. And so there is a very important role of theory of mind. So to economists in economic theory, theory of mind's relevant, though we usually don't put it in those terms. Um, psychologists, to them, theory of mind's very important in cooperation. So uh, developmental psychologists that study children, they've shown that uh, as theory of mind develops in young children, particularly through the ages of, be, between the ages of two and five, um, children actually increase in cooperativeness in social activities during that same period. And so psychologists see a strong correlation between theory of, the development of theory of mind and increased cooperation. Uh, so that's evidence that there should be a connection between theory of mind and cooperation. Uh, anthropologists and biologists that look across species, they find that there is also a kind of correlation between the theory of mind that's manifested in a species and the degree of social cooperation found in that species. So on the, the extreme, we have humans who cooperate with people they're not related to. They do this quite easily. Uh, we cooperate much more than other great apes, say gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans. We cooperate a lot much more than, than, they, than they do although they cooperate quite a bit as well, okay? And their theory of mind is not as good as ours. And those great apes cooperate better than corvids. So these are like ravens and crows, these birds, 
Okay. These actually, these birds have very good theory of mind. Okay. But it's not as good as a chimpanzee's and that's not as good as a human's. And the, the, cra the, the row, the crows and the ravens, they don't cooperate as well as chimpanzees or as well as humans. And so the anthropologists and biologists, they see a correlation across species, a positive correlation between uh, theory of mind and, uh, and cooperation. So, so what we're going to ask is, well, what about within adult humans? Okay, let's not look across species. Let's look across adult humans. Do differences in theory of mind ability correspond to differences in cooperativeness? Okay, what about the stability of that relationship? Suppose there is a, a correlation between theory of mind ability and cooperation. Is that stable across different decision-making settings? Um, if there is this correlation, does it operate solely through cognition, that is belief formation, or is it possible that forming having high theory of mind is associated with cert certain preference traits. For example, if I am better able at predicting your emotions, maybe I'm also better able to manifest empathy. Maybe I'm more likely to be afraid of how I might harm you. And so you might imagine that people who have higher theory of mind ability are more em empathetic and therefore more cooperative as a result. It could also work the other way. People with high theory of mind, maybe, Maybe they're more likely to take advantage of you. They're thinking about ways that they can take advantage of you. So it could be, you know, perhaps it's negative. So the predictions are not clear within a human population. Uh, and so we think there's going to be scope to, to look at this um, theoretically and experimentally. Mike, okay, so, yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, is there, a, I think it's related to the last two bullets here in the bullet call and now. Uh, um, is there any interplay between theory of mind and heterogeneous priors? Like, for instance, because it, it seems so like with the, when you have incomplete information, it's usually assumed that the nature is drawing the types of agents, and we get to know the distribution process, right? So you know how nature is drawing. So it seems to me that what you're saying is that some people are clueless in the sense that they they maybe they have a you know, a diffuse prior on the process of nature. You don't know how nature is is, is drawing types and, and, and you assume uh, something vague, uh, you know, diffuse prior. Or, or and, and some other agents, they, they know the process. It's more like a heterogeneous prior. I don't know if there's any discussion related to that. And the second is, I think it's related to the, the last bullet, that it seems to me that not necessarily... Um, agents or species with higher tier of mind necessarily they have to cooperate right like you're saying if you perceive that people are trying to scam you you don't cooperate like you're going to be like it's like the machiavellian type of thing right i don't know your takes on this yeah yeah so so on the second point yeah that's gonna you're we're gonna see that in the theory the theory is going to be ambiguous because people that have high theory of mind depending on what equilibrium they're in they may be more cooperative or less cooperative <clears throat> and so that's going to be you're, you're sort of, you are uh, uh, anticipating the kind of result we're going to see from the theory for that. So you're, you're, you're ahead of the game there. For the first uh, question you raised, um, so um, you will see in our, in our experimental data that in fact, depending on the game, uh, people with the higher theory of mind are going to have different beliefs. Should we call it a prior? Okay. We don't call it a prior. Uh, and uh the reason is the way we're interpreting it, <clears throat> but maybe I can maybe I can hold off on that and we can come back come back to it because in in the context right. of the, the theory you'll kind of see where we talk where where the role of beliefs enters. Um, right. But I'm not I am not aware of anyone that has modeled it as having higher theory of mind ability means that you have a different prior. But that's definitely the way that we are kind of thinking about it in the in 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 the model. Like Garrett and I when we put this together. But we don't mm -hmm. we don't have a model of the formation of a prior. Um, we don't have a formal model of that. <clears throat> right. Right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah. So good. Yeah. Good questions. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to use uh, this. We want to in, in an experiment. We want to use a simple setting um, where things are pretty transparent. So we're going to use prisoner's dilemma game. So. Um, we're gonna we're gonna use a simultaneous prisoner's dilemma game, and we're gonna use a sequential prisoner's dilemma game that has the same payoffs. Okay, so simple. 
These numbers in the matrix correspond to the dollar values that they're going to earn in the actual uh, experiment. So you, you can see what the stakes are. Um, but these are the these are the two games. Now, what would the theory say here? Okay, so there's a lot on this. There's a lot on this screen. So don't don't try to 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 get it all. But in the paper, we look at four different kinds of utility functions. The first is going to be your standard expected payoff maximization. That's the standard model that we that we use in economic theory. And then we're going to look at a few other a few other ones. Uh, I'm going to skip the outcomes based and the intentions based models, and I'm just going to focus on the social norm one as an example of a kind of model of social preferences. So these last three here are models of social preferences. So let's look at this utility function down here at the bottom. This is a utility function that is uh, that has social norm preferences. Okay, so you have a playerized utility. The first term on the right hand side is their monetary payoff. If this was an expected payoff maximizer, that would be the only term on the right hand side. Okay, but as a social norm utility individual, there's this additional term here. Now, this additional term, this is uh, we didn't make this one up. We took this from you know from the literature. Essentially, there's this indicator function here where if if player I cooperates, they're going to get some extra utility from that cooperation. Now, that extra utility depends on some social factors. The first thing is this K parameter. This K parameter uh, is their individual uh, preference for conforming to some kind of social norm. In this case, the social norm is to cooperate. So this, the norm says you should cooperate and be a good person, okay? The higher this K parameter, the more value I get from cooperating, okay? This beta param, this beta term reflects my belief about the rate of cooperation in the population. And so as a social norm, I'm more willing to adhere to a social norm the more others are, are conforming to the norm. So the higher my belief is in the rate of pop cooperation in the population, the higher my payoff from cooperating. But you see these two are going to interact here. So I might think that everyone's cooperating, but my K value is zero. I don't really care about cooperation. I don't really have any norm preference. And so I'm not going to get any utility. On the other hand, my K value could be low, but my beta value could be really high. And that might be enough to, uh, to get me to, to cooperate. So in this kind of utility framework, this is a kind of social preference utility framework, there's going to be a different role for theory of mind ability than in an expected payoff okay, uh, utility function. And we'll see from this table, this table um, describes the type of theory of mind ability that is used with different, different models of utility uh, in the, the, the games that we use. So this first column is the simultaneous prisoner's dilemma. The second column is the, the sequential prisoner's dilemma when you're the first player, the first mover. And the third column is the sequential prisoner's dilemma when you're the second mover, okay? And what we, so let's look at this first column here. Okay, so let me go to the next page. I'll come back to this table, okay? We're gonna compare this none with this down here. Now, what these terms mean, they refer to different kinds of theory of mind ability, okay? So one, what I call types, this is your ability to correctly infer the other person's type. In this model, having high theory type assessment ability would mean that I'm really good at predicting who I'm the, the K value for the people I'm paired with. Okay. Now levels one and two, this corresponds to my ability to predict the first order, what you're going to do, and the second order, what you believe about what I'm going to do. Okay, so these are two different kinds of, of uh, higher, uh, different kinds of orders of beliefs combined with a type assessment ability. These are going to be three kinds of theory of mind ability that uh, could be relevant in these models. Let's look at simultaneous prisoner's dilemma. We're going to talk about this none and why expected payoff doesn't require any theory of mind ability, but why the social norm utility does in the simultaneous move game. So why doesn't the expected payoff maximizer need theory mind ability? Well, what's in a prisoner's dilemma? If I care only about the money, I don't care what you do. I don't care whether you're a cooperator, whether you're a defector. I have a dominant strategy. I just want to defect. 
So I don't have to have a correct belief. It doesn't matter whether I care about uh, what your type is. It doesn't matter whether what, what I think your utility function is. If I have expected payoff maximization as my, as my goal, then I will just defect, okay? So I don't need theory of mind there. But if I have social preferences, what the social preferences do with this utility function, when these two, when these two terms are high, I now, if they're sufficiently high, then I now can, it might be a best response for me to cooperate when I think other people are cooperating, but it might be my best response to defect when I think other people are defecting. And so the social norm preferences, and this is a well-known feature of a lot of social preferences, they will convert what it looks like on the outside as a prisoner's dilemma. It will actually convert it into a kind of coordination game. And so we have we have a, a problem. Coordination game, we don't have a clear prediction, right? Because there's multiple equilibria. If I have high theory of mind, and that suggests that I'm better at forming beliefs uh, about what other people are going to do and their other people's traits, well, then now we have a really indeterminate uh, relationship between theory of mind and cooperation because we could be in two different equilibria. It could be that we coordinate on the defect-effect equilibrium. And if I have high theory of mind and I think that we're really likely to coordinate on the defect defect equi equilibrium, then I'm going to have high theory of mind and I'm not going to cooperate. So there's going to be a negative correlation between theory of mind ability and cooperation. On the other hand, if we coordinate on the cooperative equilibrium, then the people that have higher theory of mind are better at predicting that we're going to coop that we're going to coordinate on the cooperation equilibrium. Well, then in the data, what we should see is that the people with high theory of mind should be more likely to cooperate because they're more accurately predicting the coordination on the cooperation equilibrium. So we could get a positive correlation between theory of mind and cooperation. So this speaks to what you were saying, Marcos. So with a simultaneous prisoner's dilemma, what we see is that with expected payoff maximization, there's really no role theory for theory of mind. And with social norm payoffs, Actually, there is a role for theory of mind, but we have an ambiguous prediction. We're not sure whether theory of mind is going to be correlated with a lot of cooperation or with little cooperation. We we don't know unless we know what kind of coordination the, the uh, and their and whether they succeed in in coordinating one equilibrium or the other. Now, in the in the in the sequential prisoners dilemma, things are going to be uh, a little different. Let's go to player two here. So let's compare player two. In the if you're the second mover, again, if you're if you're an expected payoff maximizer, you don't care what other people do. You just want to defect. So you're going to defect. You don't need theory of mind. Okay. Under the social norm preferences, however, it does matter because you're trying, you're basically playing a game with your populate with the population of other people. And so if you think that even if you've been defected on, but you think that you're trying to follow a social norm that you care about following, even if you've been defected on, you might still want to cooperate. And so having theory of mind still is relevant for you in uh, as a second mover, even after uh, defection or after, whether it's after defection or cooperation. And so that's a unique feature of the social um, uh, norm preferences. Uh, so with social norm preferences, all of this, Matt, all of these types of theory of mind still matter. Uh, with the other models, it doesn't as a second mover. But as a first mover, it turns out all of the actors want to have high theory of mind. Now, this should make sense, because even if I'm an expected payoff maximizer as a first mover, I really care about how the second mover is going to react. I might only care about my own payoff, but if I'm paired with someone who is a reciprocator, and if I cooperate with them, they'll cooperate. And if I defect with them, they'll defect. I really want to know what what whether they're going to whether they're going to be that playing that kind of strategy or whether they're just always going to defect. If they're always going to defect, I want to defect. But if they might positively reciprocate, then actually I want to cooperate because then I'll convince them to cooperate. So as a first mover, there's even more scope for theory of mind ability, and it's in, and it's found in all the models. However, there is this indeterminacy. For the same reason we had uh, with the sequent with the simultaneous prisoner's dilemma, because there's multiple equilibria because of this coordination game element, and so the theory is really uh, is really quite ambiguous. 
Okay. And so this tells us that when, so first of all, it suggests that we should look at it uh, empirically because the theory is not uh, giving us a definitive uh, answer. Um, but it also suggests that the relationship between theory of mind and uh, cooperation is going to be very, very context specific. Okay. So we need to keep that in mind when we do our experiment. Okay. Michael, can I clarify just one thing? So this yes. beta is generally your belief, uh, is your belief over what is that? Maybe I'm still getting used to the notation. I yeah. understand that you're trying to guess what is the rate of cooperation, the population, like what is the percentage of people who are willing to cooperate? Um, but let's say that this beta is zero. Let's say that you believe for some reason, I don't know exactly how you are forming this belief, but let's say that it's zero. So then um, it respect to what people indeed play, um, the second term in your irritability function is going to be zero. So even though you, you, you may think that nobody's going to um, cooperate, but let's say that everyone cooperates and you don't accrue that. Is this correct or not? Because if beta i is equals to zero, so even though the, the indicator function is saying one to every single agent, you're not, you know, accruing these uh, ones, right, in your utility function. Yeah. So this, this, um, this particular utility function, it's ba it's based on some ideas that are in the social norm literature. The idea is that conformity is conditional, and so your desire to conform to a social norm is increasing in the rate of conformity by the rest of the population. So that's what this beta term here corresponds to. And it's the it's your belief about the rate of cooperation in the population. It's not it's not the rate the cooperation by your partner. Okay? This is the tricky thing about this this particular utility function. I could be paired with someone who defects on me, but there's a social norm in my community to cooperate. And I might cooperate because that's because I'm adhering to my social norm in the community even though someone has defected on me. That's what that's what this expression is capturing. Now, this beta, this goes back to your 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 first first question from uh, several minutes ago. This beta, you can think of it like a prior, okay? Right. Okay. They bring it. Very they, much like that. Yep. But you know, where does this prior come from? Okay. Mm -hmm. When they come into the lab, okay. For the purposes of the model, you can think of it as a prior. And it might be that people with higher theory of mind ability, we might imagine that their priors are going to be more accurate than people with low theory of mind ability. That's our sort of our, our, our conjecture. Um, but uh, in reality, right, I mean, people bring people come to the lab, they bring their life experience, their interactions with other people that are like the people they're interacting with in the lab. They have a base of knowledge. So that prior is a prior for this decision, but it's actually it's actually a posterior from a, a whole series of other uh, interactions they've had that as an experimenter, I haven't observed. And so for the purposes of the theory, we th we, we like to think of it uh, in, in simple terms as the prior, but from the point of view of the experiment, we realize that it's a little more complicated. Right, but you you, you can discipline like so. For instance, um, you you're gonna you're gonna make them play the game, right? That you're gonna you're gonna show us. But uh, I don't we're know. Also, we're gonna... also going to elicit. We're also going to elicit this from them. Right, uh, the initial one or no? The yeah, yeah. I'll show you. You ask them. You ask them. So yeah, you I'll ask them. I'll, show, I'll, I'll show you in a few slides. Yeah. All right. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, let me let me see, and then I'll, I'll get back to the. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, David. Uh, yeah. Hi. Thanks. Um, uh, I I think I missed part of the explanation. I don't know what the S I of H means and the H I of C. I'm assuming yeah, that C yeah. is a is a profile a strategy profile. H I of Z is a set of. The other players but i don't know which said exactly yeah yeah you didn't miss it i i went over it super quickly because i didn't want to get bogged down in it but let me go let me go into it because you asked so okay, this thanks so this term uh after the plus sign this term is a kind of extra utility psychological boost that i get from conforming to a norm but that that, that boost depends on a lot of things Okay, so first of all, it depends on whether my own strategy SI at in in at information set H is is the whether I cooperated. 
So if cooperating is the norm, then I then this indicator function, if I defect, then I don't get this any any boost. Okay. So if I cooperate at that appropriate information set, then I get uh, a boost. It's it's uh the size of that boost depends on whether how much I think other people are cooperating in the population and my own fixed preference for norm conformity. So that's what this term comes from. Now, what this is doing is, is, is this for a game in which I could have a lot of information sets at which I'm making choices, each of which might have a different norm, okay? But these H's are the different information sets. So, but in this game, you're only gonna be acting once, okay? So, I mean, I could probably simplify this from the point of view of the, of the, of the, uh, so you might, you might just, you might just get rid of the summation term right now uh, because it's um, just one person acting uh, at once. But you could, in a in a in an extensive form game, you could have norms that describe different things at different information sets as the game progresses. That's what this is. Um, that's what this is referring to. But yeah, is the SI one of the entries of the Z? Or no, uh, no. So no. S. SI is my action at this information set. And so I'm summing over all the information sets over which I make an action. Player I makes an action. But and that's it, totally unrelated to Z. It's oh, hard no. to understand wh where the S comes from. Well, though that this is my this is my action. At, this is the action that I do at this information set in my strategy. Mm -hmm. um, now the Z, this is the, the sort of the, 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 the outcome, you know, that, that, uh, that, the outcome path that, that happens that, that leads us to the different information sets. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I don't want to get too bogged down in this. Cause I, I think this is sort of, I mean, just, if you want, mm -hmm. just ignore this summation part, just ignore, ignore this uh -huh. uh, part right here and just focus on this part okay. here. Because really, in the in this game, the people are only going to be making one choice. They're not going to be making right. choices of more than one information set. We just use the general because we got it from another paper, and I probably should just remove it from this presentation, actually, because I think it is making more confusion. So, but then if you if I if I remove the summation over the 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 capital H, so I just have um, this I just have this part from K to the right. End. K, yeah. but but then what you're saying is that you you are always willing to cooperate, right? Or not, regardless the level of beta, because beta is from mm. ranges from zero to one, right? No, so I'm only willing to cooperate if this combination is sufficiently high. K can be negative. K could be positive, negative, ah, okay. really high, really low. Then, then, then it's fine. Then it's yeah. So K can run any direction. Uh huh. It's allowed to. We imagine it's we imagine it's not negative, but right. um, but that's an empirical question. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. I'm. Yeah. Sorry about that confusion. But uh, David, thanks for asking. Okay. All right, so let's let's go into the laboratory studies. So we do three studies, okay? Um, study one is going to be the simultaneous prisoner's dilemma, and the motivation for doing that is that this is just the simplest setting, and we imagine it's you now we we thought beforehand that this would be the setting that had the least role for theory mindability, okay? Uh, study two is the sequential prisoner's dilemma, um, and this is a very very minor change. Okay, all we're doing is going from simultaneous to sequential, but just two players still. But yeah, it looks like there's more scope for theory mindability to matter. Okay, so that's the motivation for study two. Study three is going to be really quite different. We're going to now have a situation where subjects are going to be able to respond to signals they get about the partner they're, they're paired with. Okay, so I, but I'll have to explain that. And there's going to be much larger scope for theory mindability in that setting. Okay, so let me talk about study one. This is what study one is. The first thing they're going to do is as a as a psychological task called the reading the mind in the eyes task, RMET. I'll I'll show you what that is in, in a second. Then they'll play the simultaneous, and this is this is a task we use to get a measure of their theory of mindability. Okay. And this comes from psychology. Okay. Um, the second thing they'll do is they'll do a simultaneous prisoner's dilemma. They'll be randomly paired with someone else uh, in the lab and play a and play a prisoner's dilemma. Uh, and then they'll answer some questions. Okay. 
So what's this reading the mind in the eyes task? Well, reading the mind in the eyes. So focus on eyes, okay? So they're gonna be shown a screen that looks like this. A, this is a photo of an actor who's acting out a kind of emotion, but it's cropped, so it's only showing their eyes. And then they're given four different possible answers. And they're asked, what do you think, which of these answers best captures what this person is thinking or feeling? Okay. They're going to do this. There's going to, they're going to see this screen and then they're going to get another one, another picture and another one. And the answers are going to be different on each screen. Um, they're going to get, they're going to see 36 different photos. Okay. And for each of these photos, there's a correct answer. There's one correct answer and three wrong answers. So the number that they get correct is going to be their RMET score. And the higher the RMET score, we interpret that as a higher theory mind ability. Uh, the, now we've shown, Garrett and I've shown in another study that the correct answer as correct in uh, as identified by the people who create by the psychologists who created this test is actually the modal answer so that that's good okay in all for all 36 in fact for 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 all sorry for all of the 36 it's not just the modal it's the majority answer except there was one where it was just below half but it was still the modal answer uh and so this is a distribution of uh, RMET score. So you can see it's a very nice spread. <clears throat> Some, a small number of people get almost perfect score. Most people are sort of in the 25 to 30 uh, correct answer range. Um, when this test was created, it was created in a way, I mean, by psycho psychologists, they didn't offer any incentivization to the subject. So the subjects had to have their own motivation to do the task uh, well. Uh, Garrett and I have also looked at whether it makes a difference, whether you pay the subjects for getting correct answers. And we, we have a paper on this, um, that where we talk about how it, it does, it can affect males and females respond differently to the incentivization, uh, in most, in student populations, generally females get about one to two answers more correct than the males, but depend, you can design incentivization schemes that flip that ranking between males and females. Uh, so we have a paper that that uh, looks at that. But um, basically, the distributions are the, the same. They're just sort of shifted. And so we just decided to use uh, the standard RMET task as a psychologist and not incentivize it. Uh, and we can control for, for the uh, student sex uh, in regressions. OK, so, so let me show you a few other pictures. Here's another picture of the eyes. Another one, another one, another one. Some of them are pretty obvious. Some of them are not obvious at all, okay, what the right answer is. And so that helps to generate this, this kind of spread. And this is one reason why we wanted to use the RMET measure for theory mindability, because uh, it generates this distribution. Other measures of theory mindability that are used, typically with uh, children, um, every adult, I mean, everyone who's over, over seven will get it right, okay? And so you, you don't get a distribution. But with the RMET, which was designed really uh, to study uh, um, autism spectrum disorder. One of the um, one of the symptoms of people with autism spectrum disorder is a diminished ability to interpret other people's emotions. And so, people that are very low on this score uh, may be on the autism spectrum disorder. Okay. Um, so this is our measure. You can actually find this online and take the test yourself online if you're interested. It's quite fun to to do. Um, but we so can, we can you can you share it? where can I find these? Uh, oh, I can. I would have to if you just Google. No, you can. We can do it later. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, yeah, if yeah. I Google, what? Well, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, if, if you Google, Google reading the mind in the ice task, you can find all, all right. that. Right. Fun all fact. Right. Fun fact. The creator of this task, Simon Baron Cohen, is the cousin of the actor Sasha Baron Cohen. Uh, you know that. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Guy. So, okay. Okay, so now, um, so that's that's the first part of the experiment. The second part uh, is to do this, the, the prisoner's dilemma game. Okay, so this is the first screen. There's gonna be another screen. And this is where they make their choice. Okay, you're gonna be randomly paired with someone in the room, select A or B, 
These are the possible earnings you can get from the different combinations of what your choice and the other person's choice are. Okay, what do you choose, A or B? A is cooperate, B is defect, but we don't use cooperate and defect words, okay? It's, so it's a, what we call cold or neutral language uh, in, um, in experimental economics. Okay, so very, this is very standard. They have a timer, okay? They make their selection, they click okay. Now on the next page, then they're asked to report their beliefs. They're asked to report what percent of the other people in the room they think selected A. This is your belief about the, the rate of cooperation in the population, okay? So this is your first order belief. And then you're asked, what's the average answer of the other people in the room to this question? So this is your second order belief. Okay, what do you think, uh, how do you think other people predicted the behavior? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a conditional prior on the payoffs, right? It's conditional on the level of payoffs that are being presented. Uh, in, I mean, what, what do you mean conditional on the level of- Well, well conditional because you already showed the numbers like six, oh, eight, yes. one, yes. right? So you're conditional. On conditional, on knowing, conditional on knowing the game, but not, but they have not yet received, they have been not yet been told the outcome of what, ha what happened in the game. No, all right, yeah. yeah. Right. Did, okay. you, did you play any other game just out of curiosity too? Uh, did you play any other table? Like, uh, nope, this was form? it. Okay. You've seen it. So they do the RMET task, 36, right. 36 uh, it, pictures of eyes. Right. Then they do this prisoner's dilemma task. And then and then the, the questionnaire. So that's yes. it. So they're not in the lab that long. Sure, sure. <clears throat> okay. And um, okay, so here's what we found. This is a, a simple you know, tabulation here. If you take the subjects by their RMET score, you take the median score, you take the median and above, and you call them the high RMET subjects, and you take the median and below, and those are the low subjects. What do you see? What's the average the, uh, within the highs? What's the uh, proportion that choose cooperate? About 0.5. Among the lows, what's the percent that choose cooperate? About 0.5. Okay, there's no difference. Okay. Now we can do some regressions, okay, to, to, to pick this apart a little bit. Okay, so if we regress RMET score on, on whether they cooperated or not, just simple linear probability model OLS, okay, with a bunch of controls, um, what do you see? There's no significance, okay? I just You just saw that from the, the prior slide, right? Now, what about this? This is re pre regressing their RMET score on their reported belief, first order belief, okay? So the people that have higher RMET are reporting slightly lower belief. That is the higher my RMET score, I think there's a little bit lower rate of cooperation in the population than the people that have low RMET. So they're a little bit more likely to predict defecting, okay? But it's not very significant, okay? It's a border marginal marginal result. And this, this um, column here, this is, this is the difference between what I reported and what actually happened, okay? So this is a measure of accuracy. So if the RMET, the high RMET subjects were more accurate, then this coefficient would be negative and significant, okay? Because the difference would be smaller. The difference between what they reported and what actually happened would be smaller. And what we find is there's really no difference. So the high RMET subjects are not any more accurate at their beliefs in the simultaneous prisoner's dilemma. But the subjects who report a higher belief, that is, they think more of the population is cooperating, they are way more likely to cooperate, okay? So really, it's some people think that there's cooperation, other people don't, and it's just not correlated with their RMET at all, not correlated with the theory of mind. And so once we control for that belief, there's really no effect of your RMET score on cooperation. Now, if there was, for example, if people who were who had higher theory mind ability were more empathetic, okay, you might find a positive and significant relationship here that there's some other effect of having theory mind ability on their willingness to cooperate. But the fact that we see it's only operating through beliefs, Right, beliefs, the beliefs that matter, there's really no other effect from RMT suggests that it's the beliefs, it's the cognition that matter. But in this game, with the RMT with our RMT is not really associated with, with cooperation. So basically, nothing, nothing here, nothing to see here. Okay. Only that people who 
predict cooperation are more likely to cooperate, which suggests that people are conditional cooperators. But we don't know why some people are predicting more cooperation and why some people are predicting less cooperation. We don't, we don't know that. We don't know why. Okay, so what did we find? The probability of cooperation is not correlated with the RBT score. Michael, can, can I ask one more thing? Yeah. Um, I don't remember the normal form game, but I, but I assume that there is multiplicity of equilibrium, right? Um, if, so if you're if, an expected, if the game, if, yeah, the, if you're the, an expected payoff, that? if you're an expected right. payoff maximizer, it is a unique equilibrium of defect effect. If you are is that you, unique, you need, right. yeah, yeah. It's a standard prisoner's dilemma. However, if you have this other kind of, if you have this kind of utility where you get some other boost, you're kind you have some kind of social preference. So right. maybe now it's not you get an extra boost beyond the money in this upper left. Now I get an extra booth boost worth five dollars, say, if we achieve right. this coordination. Well, now it this would be effectively 11 11, and now you'd have you'd have a coordination game. Yeah, I'm just thinking if you if you had flipped the main diagonal, I'm not sure if it's an equilibrium. I, I would have to check. But let's say that this, uh, six six is a defect defect equilibrium, unique equilibrium. Uh huh. Again, against three, three, cooperate, cooperate. Ah, oh, right, uh, right, right. If you have, if you have, because I'm, I'm just assuming that um, by glancing the highest pay of being the cooperate, they say, well, people are gonna cooperate. That, that it's so, it's so different, like the payoff. Yeah, yeah. That that's why they they, they form this belief because it's conditional yes. on observing the payoffs. Yeah. So why why subjects cooperate in 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 experimental studies, uh, in one shot literal one shot experimental studies? Right. We're still trying to understand it. <laughs> right, right, right. But you um, are yeah. you are I'm just correct. thinking if if they were if they would guess correctly if the payoff was lower. Uh, you are correct that if you move this number around, you can change the cooperation rate. Right. That is, that's been shown experimentally. There, there have been some nice studies that decompose different elements of the matrix here into different sort of a individual payoff and a social payoff component and an, your, your externality effect of your decision on other people. And you can right. move each of these independently to change the payoff function and move around the cooperation rate. Um, so that's 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 correct. We, we are holding this constant across all, all of our uh, for all the subjects in in study right. one. So right. <clears throat> so there's we're not varying that though. Okay. 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 So what do we find? The bottom line is theory minds not correlated with fixed preference traits. There's only weak evidence that theory mind affects beliefs, but really nothing to see here. Let's move along. Okay. Okay, now study two. Study two is exactly the same as study one. All we do is instead of doing a simultaneous prisoner's dilemma, we're going to do a sequential prisoner's dilemma. First, they'll do the RMT, then they'll do a sequential prisoner's dilemma. But they're not going to do a regular sequential prisoner's dilemma. We're going to do something called the strategy method in experimental economics. So in experimental economics, the strategy method is I'm going to have the subject report a strategy that they will play for any potential information set in that game. So I'm not going to assign them as to first and second movers, have the first movers go and then have the second movers re actually respond to the first movers. I'm going to tell all the subjects, hey, if you're the first mover, what will you do? And if you're the second mover, if the first mover cooperates, what will you do? And if you're the second mover, and the first mover defected, what will you do? So you're gonna report three different parts to your strategy, and then the computer will randomly assign you the role, and the computer will play your strategy on your behalf. Okay, this way we get a full set of data for all the subjects. We can see their full strategy. So this is a standard uh, method, a standard thing that we do in experimental economics to get a richer set of data. Okay, so when we do this, what do we find? Okay, so on the left is the, figure you already saw. This is the simultaneous prisoner's dilemma. Okay, now on the right, what we've done is, so this is the first movers. Again, we have the high RMET versus the low RMET. And what we see is that the first movers, there's a, this is a significant difference between the rate of cooperation. Now over here is, these are the second movers after defection. 
we see there's really no difference. But here, the high RMET subjects, after a first mover cooperates, the high RMET subjects are much more likely to cooperate than the low RMET subjects. Okay, so we do see significant differences here in this in the sequential prisoner's dilemma between the high RMET subjects and the low RMET subjects. Because let's pick this apart a little bit more. Okay. So these regressions look at the at the beliefs. So if I so this so I'm regressing the RMET score on people's beliefs. So if we want to call it the prior, we can call it the prior, Marcos. So here, um, the high RMET, the higher your RMET, the more likely you're you are as a first mover, uh, the more likely you are to think first movers are going to cooperate. And if you're high RMET sub, you're more likely to think the second movers will positively reciprocate a cooperation by a first mover. But the second, everybody, everybody knows that after a defection, there's going to be defection. Okay. There's no difference. So what's going on here is that the army T, so it seems like there's, there's maybe there's something more socially sophisticated going on. And the, there's a little more social subtle, there's more subtlety going on with these first mover and first mover after cooperation decisions. Whereas this action after the first mover defection seems easier for the subjects. Uh, and, but there is a clear difference uh, in belief, in the belief, uh, the prior belief for the higher MET subjects. Not only that, the higher MET subjects are also right. So the higher MET subjects are predicting more cooperation by first movers and predicting more cooperation by second movers after first mover cooperation, and they are right. So this is, we have this negative and significant on the, for the variable for accuracy. So their belief is closer to the, tr what actually happens. And we see that for the belief about first movers, the belief about second movers after cooperation. And again, no difference here. So the high RMET subjects are more accurate in their beliefs. How does this, now this is predicting the cooperation. <clears throat> so the high RMET subjects they are more likely to cooperate as first movers. We saw that in the figure already. They're more likely to cooperate as second movers after cooperation. We saw that in the figure because this is just the regressions showing what we found in the figure. <clears throat> but <clears throat> this is a more interesting regression. <clears throat> Excuse me. If we control for what they believe as first movers, notice that if we control for the subject's belief about other first movers moving, the effect, there's no more effect of the RMET score. In other words, the high RMET subjects have higher belief. That's making them report higher beliefs, but there's really no other added effect to having high RMET. So if they had high RMET, high, higher theory of mind, and that made them more empathetic or more willing to cooperate or more, they care more about the social norm, then we would see an effect above and beyond the effect of the belief only, we would see something positive and significant here, but we don't, we don't see it. So this is telling us that RMET is being, the effect of RMET is only through the beliefs. Once we control for beliefs, there's no other impact of RMET. <clears throat> so that's what these regressions are, are uh, showing us here. And we see the significance here in the other roles. So the bottom line from study two is that theory of mind does affect cooperation through beliefs. But it's and it's through beliefs, not through the fixed preference traits. But <clears throat> this effect of theory mindability on cooperation, it's contingent, right? So it depends on the role that you're that you're in. So you know our theory, our theory said we don't know whether it's positive or negative. We found that it's positive in this experiment, in this experiment, and that's because the people happen to be cooperative. These are UC, UC Irvine University students. And the UCI University students who come into this experiment, they have had experience with other UC Irvine and University students. And the high theory mind subjects are better able at predicting that past experience and forming their belief about how their what the behavior might be. Could be if that we had a very different student population here, that the higher MET subjects would be coordinating on a low, co low cooperation equilibrium. Okay, so we can't say from this study that Oh, this is why cooperation, uh, the high theory mind leads to cooperation. We, 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 we can't claim that. That would be going beyond what our results are showing. In this setting, the high theory mind subjects are correctly predicting and they're more cooperative, but that's in this setting. 
<clears throat> okay, now the third one. Okay, so this one's pretty different, okay? So what we're gonna do here, and this one's this one's actually, oh yeah, David, you have a question? Uh, <clears throat> did the students know who they were cooperating or not against, who, who they were playing against? They or there was a so they were in a they're in a in our oh you know I should have I should have showed a picture of our lab so they're in a computer lab our experimental lab here and they're sitting at a computer station um and they see their other students in the room they're randomly paired with one of them they know it's someone in the room but they don't know which one <clears throat> so in that in that sense it's anonymous <clears throat> and there's going to be 20 20 you know 25 20 26 people in the room approximately. Um, so in that sense, it's anonymous. Now it's possible that they know someone in that room. UC Irvine's a pretty big school, you know, we've got 30,000 students. Um, it's possible they know someone in that room. Uh, and sometimes people will sign up for experiments together and go with their friend, but there's no way they know who they're paired with. Uh, they don't have any information on which person in the room they're paired with. Thanks. So they have they have information from prior history about the population, the student population. Some information, but they have to sort of make an inference about what I know about this friend that I studied with in another class, or this friend who shared their lecture notes with me, or this other friend who didn't share their lecture notes. They have to take that information and somehow use that to form a belief about how people in this room are going to play in this very uh, weird prisoner's dilemma game. <clears throat> Um, Michael, uh, do you know uh, if the students had taken uh, game theory classes before or no? We do. We we do ask them their major. And so we have the information. Um, we did not specifically ask if they had taken a game theory class, but if they're an, if they're an economics major, they almost surely will have seen a prisoner's dilemma. But if you have administrative data, right? So you, you, you can go we, there and we, I, you know. We, we we would have to re get special permission from the university I to see. get that and the university okay, okay. they won't they won't give it but you do, 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 do you control for that because these can you know wash away these yeah we perhaps. we do we do have several controls here we do I think we did some with the major but I, I don't see it it's not it's uh it's not significant um uh, what what you end up seeing I mean you do see sometimes gender differences. Sometimes it's the females who are actually more defecting than the males. Um, they also have a higher theory of mind a lot of times, which is kind of interesting, but not in this experiment. Um, yeah, I would control for uh, so we, in, this, in all these regressions if the student is from econ or STEM uh, major. Yeah, yeah. So we have their major. I think we did it. I don't know. I'd have to talk to Garrett. I can't remember why it's not in the table. Maybe we have, maybe we just did, maybe we, yeah, I'll have to ask him why, why it's not, but we do have that. And what, what you see is it's not hugely significant across major. There's really not a major difference. Um, I did, interestingly enough, we did a study, we specifically compared economic students and anthropology students uh, in an experiment. And what we found were the economic students were more cooperative. So that was interesting. Um, but yeah, that's a different, different study. So sometimes these things don't go as you predict. Um, but I think that kind of thing is a bit noisy even. And they so, play just once, right? Yeah. Just oh, once. I understand. They just are once. uniformly at random, like we, with, with another player and, and they play once and, and it's done. Yeah. So they, they come into the lab, um, they come into the lab, they sit down at a computer station. There are these uh, dividers so that they're making this decision. They cannot see any other subject screen. Um, they, they actually pull these dividers out. So they actually can't even, you know, if they mm -hmm. just sit where they are, they can't see the other subjects. They'd have to lean back their chair to try to look. And even if they lean back, they can't really see the other screens. Uh, so it creates a kind of privacy. Uh, mm -hmm. And then they're, they're randomly paired, but the computer does it and they don't know who they're paired with. So, uh, so it's pretty anonymous. This is pretty standard uh, way of doing the prisoner's dilemma. Right. Yeah. All right. So study. Let's go to study three. Okay. So study three. <clears throat> so I think I have fifteen minutes. So, um, so study three. What we're interested in. We're going to put subjects in the role of the first mover. 
Okay, remember the first mover is this interesting one where the theory of mind seems to be more relevant. And we're gonna put them in the role of the first mover in the sequential prisoner's dilemma game. However, they're not gonna play against another subject. They're gonna play against a pair of eyes, okay? We're gonna use the same eyes. They're gonna make, they're gonna make a decision of cooperator defect, okay? Against each of the pair, each of the pairs of eyes. So they're gonna do this, make, they're gonna select A or B as a first mover 36 times. So this is one screen, then they'll click okay, and then they'll see another screen that has different eyes. Okay. And then they're also going to try to guess what they think these eyes will do as the second mover. Okay. Now they're going to choose this A or B. And then they what the what these eyes actually do, because they're as the first mover, they got to they got to get a payoff. What this what these eyes actually do, they're paired with. Um is determined by the computer, but we program the computer in a very specific way. Okay. So in study three, the second group, we call it protocol B. These are the subjects that made the first mover decision. Protocol A was subjects that came in earlier. And what they did was they did not play the prisoner's dilemma game. What they did was they saw each pair of eyes and they tried to predict what they think someone with these eyes would do. And they're going to get paid money whether or not what they predict is what other people in the in this group of subjects also thought that these eyes would do. In other words, what we're trying to do is we are trying to elicit from our subject, our student population, what is the consensus, the social consensus on what these eyes would do as second movers in the prisoner's dilemma game? What would they do after cooperation? And what would they do after a defection? Okay. So we're trying to elicit a social consensus on the cooperativeness of these eyes. Okay. And then, and then the main thing we're looking at is the, 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 the second half of the students, protocol B students, who are going to then play against these eyes. Okay. So that's, that's how we did it. Okay. And so this is what we see. Okay. Now there's a little, let, let me explain this. Some of the eyes, so so when you look at these eyes and you predict what they're going to do, some of these eyes, uh, it's pretty clear that most of the students think that these eyes are going to cooperate after cooperation. And some of the eyes, it's pretty clear to the, to the students, they think that these eyes are going to defect even, even after cooperation. And then for some of the eyes, there's really no consensus. It's about half the students think it's cooperate and half the students think it's defect, okay? So we're gonna split the eyes into three groups. There's the eyes that are clearly gonna cooperate. So that's more than 65% of the subjects thought that these eyes would cooperate. Those are clear cooperating eyes. And then we have clear defecting eyes, which is less than 35% of the subjects thought those eyes would cooperate. So these are eyes are more likely to defect. And then we have this group in the middle, we call them the unclear eyes, where it's unclear whether these eyes are gonna cooperate or defect, okay? And so for each of these eyes, we can now look at army at the subjects in the in the in who made the actual choice as first movers against those eyes, how did they behave? And what we see is, we see that the for the high eye, for the high army T subjects, so this, second blue square and this second green one and this second pink one, notice that the slope is much higher as we go from the clear defect eyes to the clear cooperate eyes for the high army T subjects. Whereas for the low army T subjects, the slope is much lower. What this is saying is that the high army T subjects, they're good at identifying who the defecting eyes are and who the cooperating eyes are. And so they are responding and they're responding to it. So when the high RBT subjects see a pair of eyes, they're and they're pretty good at guessing defection, they're gonna defect. They're gonna defect at higher rates. They're not gonna cooperate. But if they see eyes that are more cooperative, they're cooperating at higher rates. So the high army, the, the, the subjects with the high theory mind ability, they are more responsive to the emotional signal from the eyes um, compared to the other subjects. Is it true to say that um, uh... The low, um, the low scores, they are messing up uh, more, right? Because if they believe that um, the eyes are clearing defecting, 
then they should be playing, they should be cooperating less, but they are cooperating more with yes. respect to the, the high scores, right? And yep, it's exactly. the other way around, the way they perceive the, the eyes, there's clearing, cooperating, right? So they... they exactly. They, yeah, it's yep. interesting. Yep. They're yep. messing up in both cases. That's right, exactly. Um, they're messing up in both cases. And so so this is just... Um, this is just showing what the figure, the figure basically showed it all. This is, this term here is showing us the difference yeah. in the slope. Okay. Right. That I, that I pointed out. Um, and, uh, and then this is, this is what you're getting at Marcus, which is they're messing up in the sense that they're really getting lower payoffs. So right. um, in this over here, they should be, if I mean, they, they're miscoordinating, right? So here the coordination is on, not cooperating and here the coordination is on cooperating and so the high rmt subjects are co coordinating here uh and the low ones aren't and they're suffering and they're payoff and there's a there's a payoff consequence so the high rmt subjects are getting higher payoffs because they right. are the, they're better they're they're de protecting themselves against defectors but they're taking advantage of and they're taking advantage of getting paired with a cooperator right so this um yeah so one one other one other thing to note if you were to look at this figure you'd say oh so who's more cooperative the the high rmt subjects or the low rmt subjects well one's not more cooperative than the other right i mean the high rmt subjects are more cooperative against these eyes but they're less cooperative against these eyes so it, again it tells you that this Theory mindability, it doesn't make you cooperative automatically. It's it's an it's a cognitive skill, a set of cognitive skills that you can use that enable you to find cooperation when it's available, but enable you to avoid being taken advantage of when the cooperation is not available. And so we can't just say there's a simple correlation between high theory mindability and, and, and cooperation. It's very context specific. So in our earlier experiment, it's as if in our in in study two, where people were paired anonymously and didn't know who they were paired with, they had they received no signal of the emotional state of the person they're paired with. The high theory mind people, they, it was like this situation, because the UC, University of California Irvine students are pretty positively reciprocating, and the higher MIT subjects kind of know that. So their prior was that the higher MIT subjects had a higher prior on what the other people would do. Um, but if we were at a different university, I don't know, where would where would University of Sao Paulo be? Would it be down here or would it be here? You have to tell me. Yeah. I mean, probably it's up here, I would imagine. But um, you know, different setting, it would be a different, a different equilibrium. And so we don't have a simple correlation. So the bottom line me, sorry, oh, this yeah. is sorry, um, my image is not there, but just to to I was wondering, as you said, well it's not clear if it's uh if this higher skill uh, boosts or, or favors more cooperation, but I was thinking that maybe in one way, yes, because uh, the situation in, in your previous slide, when we do want more cooperation, is in an environment of a cooperation. We, we don't want cooperation in an environment of a clear defeat, because in that in that environment, cooperation only will allow it to be taken advantage of. So in a way, if we think, say, well, for a better society, a more co cooperative environment is good. And <clears throat> this is the only environment in which we can have a healthy collaboration, right? Where there is collaboration in the environment, and then you want individuals also to, to, to add to that environment. So in a way, I would say, yes, this skill helps to create co cooperation. We should just put a comma or an observation in the environment in which it works. But yeah, can yeah. I can I say that? I think that's fair. I mean, it's it's very conditional, and yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, it's enabling cooperation, more cooperation in in this setting. Um, I mean, it's if you think of cooperation as not the likelihood that one person cooperates, but the likelihood that both people cooperate then exactly exactly yeah then then that's definitely higher here however i mean down here the low theory mind people are 
they're the ones that are more likely to achieve double cooperation. So, I mean, I mean, it's not. Uh, it is, but their uh, higher collaboration is is a caveat. It's is not good, right? Because the environment does not pay off for collaboration. So this is not the environment in which we should be looking for collaboration, if I understood. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I know. I see. I see. I see. I mean, I think definitely you can say that um, the theory of mind is enabling something. I mean, it's definitely enabling the actors to coordinate better. And in some settings, that is going to enable and that's going to be cooperation. So, yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Or uh, alternatively, Michael, right? let's say, for instance, if you simply um, take a look at the green, the green part, right? When people are unclear. So people are unclear, right? So they, it's like, I, I don't know, it's like they have a, a vague prior. And still, if there is a statistical significance towards high, let's say, then you can claim, right? That, that STEM uh, maybe has a has some role in you know in coordinating yeah. or improving cooperation or something like that yeah we didn't see much difference with these right. eyes that in this case right. but you know it's i mean this is one this is one setting uh you know there could be a different setting where where there's a bigger difference uh with the un with unclear eyes um or different pay or there are the or you change the payoffs right, right in the matrix you could potentially right. uh get something different right. So, so yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, my, my prior, okay. So my prior is that theory mind super important in cooperation. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. I mean, right. it may, it doesn't guarantee it. Okay. But it makes it, it makes it possible in settings where it wasn't possible before that. That's how, that's my prior. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cooperation. Mm -hmm. And, and so I'm uh, Damien, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, th I think we think alike on that. Um, I'm not trying to, uh, uh, discredit theory of mind ability as a as an important thing in human society i think it's very important that's why i'm that's why i study it um but i think I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to temper our i mean in the literature there's this presumption that theory of mind ability just makes people you know better and and i'm trying to say well you know actually it's still very conditional and it's uh the the reality is a lot more subtle and interesting than just a simple um relationship i think that's probably the way i would I would say it. Um, okay, so okay, so the bottom line is high theory mind ability individuals are more more sensitive to the emotional signals. Okay, well, of course, I mean that's uh, how we define RMT. But in this setting, um, in this setting, they um, the it's 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 affecting their payoffs. So. Um, so there's a real advantage. Now this, we think, uh, you know, is, we should expect this, right? Um, but we we think there's a nice, uh, this this nicely fits the uh, anthropological literature and the evolutionary, especially in evolutionary anthropology and evolutionary biology that's tried to argue that theory of mind had fitness benefits uh, in, you know, early human history. And so we, we think that uh, this is, uh, you know, co corroborates that story, which is, look, I mean, if emotional signals are meaningful, they, they might be noisy, but they still can convey information, even if they're noisy, people who are better able to, uh, better able to interpret these signals uh, should have a fitness advantage. And, um, and so we think we kind of support that, um, that idea in a very sort of roundabout way. Okay, so this is the last slide. Um, so the main findings. Uh, well, the theory is, is a bit ambiguous. A high theory mind ability subjects, they might cooperate more, they might cooperate less. It depends on the setting because there's this underlying coordination game element. Um, theory of mind uh, operates, what we found empirically was that theory of mind ability op seems to operate through beliefs, not through some other fixed preference trait. Uh, and uh, in the right setting, subjects can achieve a payoff advantage from having high theory mind ability. Um, so what are the larger implications? Uh, well, the first is that Okay, we we think uh, it's important for economists to recognize the role of cog cognition and cognitive abilities in 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 understanding human cooperation. Um, we think one of the reasons why it really matters in in economic models is that uh, it really matters when you think about social preferences. So, uh, when you have a utility function that has social preferences, um, now it's very important for people to more accurately uh, uh, anticipate what's happening 
and, and more accurately predict what's happening in their social setting. And so the theory mindability becomes really important when people have these kinds of preferences. And so the extent that economists want to rely on models of social preferences, um, they need to be thinking about uh, theory mind and differences in people of theory minds, uh, theory mind ability, differences in people's theory mind ability. Uh, we found that theory mind seems to operate only through cognition. It's a cognitive trait. It's not uh, tied to people's uh, preferences. Uh, you know, that's just in the context of what we found. You know, maybe in other settings, you, you could find uh, a stronger connection, but we just didn't find it here. Uh, and we think that, you know, there's more theoretical and experimental work that needs to be done looking at the cues, the social cues and that people use to that, that they, that uh, they use to form these beliefs uh, and to take advantage of the theory mind ability that they have. That's it. Great, Michael. Thank you. Um, any more questions? I do actually have a comment, Michael. Um, yeah. When you when you for, when you start presenting the paper, for me, I started you know forming the belief that the paper would be more like about forming beliefs over um, mixed strategies, for instance. Like because if players are rational, you know they are various maximizers, right? They want to increase entropy, so they so players don't know what they are doing. They they are uniform, they are randomizing or or something like that. And maybe that's a feat also for for this type of theory because it, it seems to me that it depends on the game. The game you showed us is a unique uh, in, uh, equilibrium in pure strategies. So the, the prior should be the Nash equilibrium, I per, presume, right? Or maybe because people mess up in game, I don't know, right? Uh, or maybe there's a framing, right? Well, if, because people I mean if they have social preferences, then then the the pay then the monetary payoffs aren't capturing all the utility information is the problem. No, you're right. Yeah, you you're never gonna observe the the utility function, right? But uh I mean, ba basically, you run these. Uh, I don't know if there's any experimenters here, but uh, you run this. You run a prisoner's dilemma experiment. You're gonna, you're gonna get. You know, half the subjects are gonna cooperate, and then you know, and then uh, uh, the next. Uh, if if you run like a sequential prisoner's dilemma, even you're gonna find a, a bunch of people are just these cooperators. They're they're like conditional cooperators. That's the most common strategy. They'll cooperate as first mover, and then they'll like uh, cooperate against cooperation, defect against defection. That's like the most common. And then, and then you get the people that are pure defectors. That's like the next most likely. They're like a minority, but they're like a big minority. And then you right. get like some weird. Then you get the weird people who like, you know, well, you get the pure cooperators who cooperate no matter what the other person does. And then you get the the people who are like the anti. They're the anti conformists, you know. Who, right, right, who right. They defect on the cooperator and they cooperate on the defector. And you know, this is like a small percent of people. And you know, you see, but there's the conditional cooperators are the are the most common strategy. So this is something. There's something deeper about humans. I mean, you find this in a lot of a lot of experiments run around uh, run around the conducted around the world that sure, and it sure. really changes it really changes the game and so you know like think using the using the nash equilibrium from just the monetary payoffs um we 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 will get uh in this game um yeah yeah i i, I think now I, I i know how to phrase the question mike i think i i didn't put the question right because um my my I think what's what's troubling me is that when you present the the normal form to them with the payoffs, with the fixed payoffs, you're already telling them how much they're gonna accrue in terms of utility, right? Usually, when you present normal form games to students, you're, you're just telling them, look, if this happens here in these all four cases, this is how much is going to enter in your utility, and if your utility is linear, right? So it's, it's money in the utility, right? Um, but what you're saying is, is not exactly correct, right, for them, because um, you're not representing in the table what is this export ut utility they're going to get. You, you understand I, we what tell I'm saying? Them, we... you're, 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 you're telling them how much they're going to get in the first part of the utility function, in the, if you go back uh, to your utility function. Well, we... I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah, we we don't know what the subject's utilities functions are. Right, you're never gonna know. But yeah, and, and yeah, um, exactly. So, we, so 
So, but, but, um, so they're told, yeah, they're told this is their, this is the money that they earn. Right. But we don't tell them, we don't tell them that their goal is to get the most money. We don't tell them, you know, what they should care about. We don't, we don't tell them what their objective no, is. No, no, right, right. No, no, you're right, Michael. And, and, and actually your goal is, is, is to, to estimate this parameter, right? That is invisible and, and, and it's something that supposedly is there in the UTV function. But you you don't get to observe we're, in the in the monetary payoffs. Yeah, we're we're not estimating the param. We're not we're not trying to estimate the utility function. We're we be, because we know there's heterogeneity. So we 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 don't think that I mean there might be a utility function that represents sort of the median person or the average, but we we are we're interested in the in the um in the in in there being a distribution so we 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 suspect that if if we think that say this is the utility function we suspect that there's quite a variety in the case and some are going to be very low some are going to be very high um and then we know there's going to be variation in these betas we were interested in whether these might be correlated with theory mindability we're not going to estimate them directly but we are going to see if we can imply infer something about them through our regressions but we didn't estimate them direct i think you know they're one of the studies that used one of those utility functions did i think he tried to estimate like that k parameter yeah the paper um that wasn't our goal but we could i mean i guess we could try to we could try to fit i uh, i mean the thing is you only have one choice per subject and so you observe them cooperate, you know that their beta IKI uh product was high, but you don't know how high it was. You'd have right. to get you'd have to get a lot more observations, I think. Did, did you ask any questions about how how much they like of cooperation? I don't know either, because this sounds more like the K parameter, right? One is the beta that you are eliciting from them in the beginning and, and you're um you no, we observe. didn't yeah. we didn't ask it, we didn't ask anything like that. Um I'd have to think, I mean, there, there probably is a way to ask a question that could give us something. I'd have to think about that. How or maybe in your data set that you already have, maybe there is something in there that is a proxy for how much they like. Just to have an idea on how this K is, because the person maybe don't like operation, right? Maybe they, for some reason, they, they believe yeah. that beta is high, but they want to defect, yeah. right? Because they, they, they don't like operation. Yeah, I think if I think that uh, if if uh, estimating the k parameter was the goal, well, okay, there's a couple things here. So um, if you make an assumption that the k parameter is fixed for the individual and it's the, and it's stable across settings, then what you'd want to do is you'd want to have them make a whole series of choices by and making subtle making changes to the payoffs, and then find out and then keep raising raising and lowering the payoffs to to make them at some point flip from cooperating to defecting and defecting right. to cooperating and so then you could try to um find yeah. where their, where their cutoff is uh, right. so i think that would be and that would be the main uh that would be the i i think that would, i mean that seems to me the direct way to try to try to estimate it. but you need to have a lot of choices um now the idea that I mean, when that sort of utility function has been studied before, I mean, the presumption was that K is fixed across settings, like it's sort of unique to the individual, but it's stable for the individual. Um, that uh, that uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Maybe that's true. I, I, I mean, it's simple to assume it, uh, and it seems like it's pretty good to uh, first first assumption to make, but it's not clear that. I mean, maybe some people are more responsive to norm following norms in some settings than others, um, you know, and, and it's could be very culturally uh, biased. Um, um, but I haven't seen any any study that's uh, and then maybe there's something, but I haven't seen a study that's really examined that uh, aspect uh, of it. But I think it's, uh, you know, I think there's so much more to be done. This is one, this utility function with the social norms is one, it's, it happens to be the one that Garrett and I like the best mm -hmm. uh, because we think it fits the data better, but um, it has more move, it has more uh, 
degrees of freedom than some of the other models. So a simple outcome-based model where you just sort of have an inequity aversion parameter, you know, instead of two parameters, you've got one free parameter. And so mm -hmm. um, that model has been fit to data uh, at times. Um, and so, you know, everyone has their, there's no consensus in the literature on which model's best. Some people have, everyone's got their favorite. Mm -hmm. And this, this causes a problem when you submit a paper, because if you, I know. If you get, if you get someone who likes the other one that you don't that's like, right. then you're in real trouble. That's it's a gamble. It's that's a gamble. Happened to it's us. a referee, a referee gamble. Yeah, that happened to us. We know who the referee was. We know exactly what we can tell from the comments that he was one who liked the other model and we and we kind of struck out, unfortunately. But uh, um, so we're trying to we're trying to hedge our bets in this paper by by using different by using the different models, um, showing the different models and saying, hey, you know, they give different they, they, they you know, there's theory mind matters differently in them. And we're not saying one's better than the other. But in fact, we're going to our data are going to find that uh, the social norm is going to want to do the best because the theory mind matters in the social norm for the second movers in sequential prisons dilemma. And it right. doesn't matter for the other ones. So, um, so this is, yeah, this is something that we, uh, that we see, which, well, which, you know, sort of confirms our bias in favor of that, that version. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Yeah. Well. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I, and thanks for staying late. Uh, no, no, it's not that late. It's five twenty-six. It's, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's time to go home, but it's fine. Okay. Well, traffic is. Uh, traffic, you know. is traffic is horrible. Traffic is horrible here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time to get to know you guys and to share some of this work. Perfect. Thanks, and thanks for the questions. They're going to be good. We're we're. We're still trying to get this thing published. So uh, all good the feedback is helpful. Good, great, great. Michael. All right. All right.